talk a bit about uh, some of the basic framing of the ESPER research questions that the director has been developing over the last couple of years. And, uh, and I'm drawing on a lot of the work that um, um, Helen Such and Caroline Howard done as the researchers. Um, and this is really just, this is a two-way thing. That we try to develop these concepts in a way that um, really work on all the projects and then feedback and so that the whole thing should be um, an evolutionary process. But um, it's based on the idea that ESPER is going to be more than the sum of its parts. And therefore here are three big projects all looking at things in the same area. And one of the roles of the director is to try and draw um, way, draw together the major conclusions in some way at the end of the program. And for that reason it's important that we maintain some um, continuity of thought and some agreement on concepts and methods and tools and so on across the project. Now that's not intended in any way to prescribe how you will go about it. So I mean, this talk will be at very high level and that's why I say it's for research and theory. I'm not going to occasionally I won't be able to avoid going into some detail. I'm going to steer well clear of all the things that you did. So I just want to briefly run through all the things that have worked in here. The overall ESPA conceptual framework, um, ecosystem services and goods and benefits, the distinction between those ecosystem services and biodiversity, and the distinction between those multidimensional quality and its evaluation, ways of thinking about scale and ways of thinking about the changing context. And I think in the presentation we've heard most of these mentioned already. So the conceptual framework for ESPA um, is, um, is there for the, for the reasons that people normally have conceptual frameworks. The system of interest is the relationship between the system services and poverty alleviation. And we need to have a common understanding um, of some assumptions about interrelationships and linkages. And these are very, um, they're very general things. They're just to provide a way that we can even talk projects. Um, so you'll see when well, you'll know the ESPA conceptual framework, it's very generic um, and projects need to develop their own framework and you, many of you already have them. The thing that I'm raising is we need to make sure that they're at least consistent and compatible with the overall ESPA framework. So don't take too literally the ESPA one but just take it to be high level assumptions about interrelationships into account. So this is the one that's been the ESPA framework for a while. We're looking at it again. We'll probably do some work to revise it later this year. So if you've got comments on it, then um, please, let, please let me know what they are. Um, it, is, it is very high level. It just assumes there are these three things to do with um, enabling conditions or the overall um, environment, political, socio-economic, institutional, the um, natural environment, the green bit in which ecosystems are functioning and providing um, ecosystem services, which are good, value the benefits to people, and then the human well-being and poverty thing in the middle. And ESPA is about the way in which those interact across those three. Um, and of course, all that is in the context that we don't live in a static world. There's all these things changing, population, demography, climate, environment and land use, institutions, governments, technology, social and cultural values. So that, so that whole thing is, is also changing through time. So that's the conceptual framework. I don't think, uh, it'd be very difficult to come up with something that was fundamentally opposed to that. But there are some details in there that are important. Um, and one of them is about how we view ecosystem services. Um, so in ESPA, we do separate um, the goods and benefits that come from ecosystem from the ecosystem services that deliver them. Um, so the benefit is the thing that has an impact on changes in human well-being. So, it, so something like food is actually a benefit. It's not an ecosystem service because it's the food that provides the benefits to people. I'll go through this in, in, in a bit more detail. Whereas the ecosystem services are the things that are going on in the environment um, and include the biophysical processes and ecosystems that deliver those benefits to people. 
And that is uh, fundamentally different from the way the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment did this. In the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, and in most of what you all talked about, I think, you're treating um, services as the same as benefits. And so they all, um, they all just become the same, the same thing. Now, why, should, why do we want to separate services from benefits? Um, firstly, the benefits arise from managing ecosystems for their services. So it's not inevitable, given any environment, that a set of benefits will come from it. If you just measure the condition of the environment, there are a variety of ways in which you can imagine those benefits, and particularly the value of those benefits. So, for example, um, fresh water has very different values if it's um, produced by an ecosystem in the only place in the entire landscape where it's fresh water versus if it's a long way away from it. That's a sort of spatial thing. Uh, fresh water may have a greater value in a hot, dry summer than it does in a in a um, but the ecosystem is exactly the same. The ecosystem service is the same. The way it's perceived by people varies. Um, secondly, many un many ecosystem un ecosystem services underpin each benefit. So, if you look at something like um, food, or good health, or flood protection, it's coming from a variety of things in the ecosystem. And there's different ways that you can manage the ecosystem to get water good health, enough food and so on. And if you treat services and benefits the same, it's very difficult to look at those options. Um, thirdly, the, service, the ecosystem processes and services themselves are interdependent, and they rely on some uh, non-changeable bits of the environment. And so that needs some very spatially explicit modeling about uh, ecosystem services, which means that you need to understand all those processes that flow through this diagram. So what we suggest is um, separating the goods and benefits um, and then looking at those relationships to people. So from here backwards is in the environment um, and here are the goods and benefits. When you add other things to them, including extraction, processing, transport, markets and so on, they then become goods and benefits that are available to people that have a value. And that value could be an economic value, it could be a health, better or worse health, it could just be some well-being metric that's on a qualitative scale. Um, so just to make this a bit more, um, so this is an example, say, for timber. The, there's a bunch of things going on in ecosystems, water cycles, nutrient cycling and so on, that allow this to be trees or a wood or a forest. And that's that's the ecosystem service. The goods are the things that you use that for that provide benefits to people. Timber, carbon sequestration provides an equitable climate, there are lots of species diversity provides recreation values and so on. This is in the ecosystem, that is benefits to people. And if you think about any particular landscape or any particular system, you can come up with a list of ecosystem services, how do you, you want to organise these within the ecosystem? Um, there are various thoughts about that. But this is the important thing, that's the list of goods and benefits that people are deriving from that system and, and the relative values of each of those two people. Now imagine that you then wanted to look at um, converting this, imagine this is a forest area, you to convert the wood into agriculture, can look at what happens to those goods under that conversion. So, say in this case, uh, because we're converting it to agriculture, food will go up, timber will go down, water quality will go down. I'm not going to say anything wrong, but this would be the general picture. And similarly, or conversely, if you convert agriculture to woodland, you get a set of different relationships, and then you can look at these values. So, that's a rather long winded discussion of separating goods from benefits, uh, sorry, services from goods and benefits and why uh, we think in terms of looking at the impact of, on people of ecosystem <coughs> services, it's important to do that. Uh, the second one I want to look at is biodiversity and ecosystem services. This is kind of a complicated 
areas. Sometimes people treat them as the same thing. Sometimes biodiversity is an ecosystem service. Um, sometimes biodiversity is assumed to be necessary for all ecosystem services. And actually there are at least three different ways in which biodiversity sits within that kind of framework that I've talked about. It, biodiversity is quite often a regulator of ecosystem processes. Biodiversity within ecosystems has major influences on ecosystem processes and functions. Secondly, sometimes we want biodiversity, diversity per se, as in lots of variability, um, as a final service. We want to derive variability of food, crops to make them resilient to disease. You might want um, variability of wildlife in the environment for disease regulation and so on. And then thirdly, sometimes what people mean by biodiversity is wild species <coughs> that we just value for their own life. So they're actually a benefit. They're no longer a service. They're, they're a good or a benefit that people are getting value for. So, um, separating those is important. And I'm just going to show you an example. This comes from the Wenson catchment in East Anglia. It's a long way from an ESPA project. <coughs> so here are a set of um, goods that people would like to get from the Wenson catchment. Clean water, clear water, food, uh, wildlife, and game and fisheries. And there's a set of um, interventions that managers in that area could make on that landscape. And in the middle is a set of biodiversity <coughs> that affects the relationship between those management interventions and what these goods are. This chart is actually flowing this way. And all those things in circles might be biodiversity. These are the kind of goods and benefits ones. These are lots of regulating things that affect how any intervention that you make over here, let's say uh, gradients in soil nutrients, Affects, oops, sorry, affects the um, ecosystem services and then the goods. And it's in these kinds of systems that you get these non-linearities, tipping points, and so on. Many of these regulating processes are incredibly non-linear and very complex. They're interacting with each other in lots of ways. And if biodiversity is just treated as being an ecosystem service, like here, or if it's only treated as being some kind of underpinning system, then you miss all those dynamics. Okay, poverty and poverty alleviation. Um, I think it's important in your projects that you actually have a definition of what you mean by poverty. Yes, but it's all about poverty alleviation. Um, and here's a couple of uh, definitions that, as a starting point, and, and uh, there's a whole literature on this that um, contribute to very many ways of thinking about poverty. Um, one of the issues about poverty analysis is they, and they often just describe the condition of being poor, rather than considering how or why that condition exists, what are the processes that lead to poverty. And in particular, um, it is often not a static or homogeneous condition in any society. Social differentiation, distribution, how issues and so on are all very important for positive analysis. So ESPA recommends that we think about poverty in a multi-dimensional context, um, that it occurs within and is affected by a whole range of other factors. Um, it doesn't affect who you consider is poor, but it does affect how you conceptualize and measure it. And in particular, um, projects need to think about the dimensions that they're including in poverty and also think about the dynamics um, and inequalities in that whole system. So this is a list of some poverty dimensions. You, in any particular context, you have to think of the poverty dimensions that are most relevant for the system you're looking at. Um, but it is worth be, trying to be fairly um, in your assessment of what poverty dimensions are going to be included. Make sure everything that's relevant is included. And also, think about not just one measure of poverty, but, and I've heard some discussions about this already, the fact that poverty uh, may be chronic, it may be transient, these um, seasonal effects, the uh, 
um, changing effects from one social group to another over quite small spatial scales. Um, the fact that being, um, being poor only occasionally is still being poor is an important aspect. So, so not just to take it as a very static measure. And thirdly, to consider vulnerability um, and equity. And again, there's been some discussion about this. Um, that there may be um, cases where the circumstances of some people mean they're very sensitive to shocks. Um, even though they may not apparently be poor at, at any particular moment in time. And those who are sensitive may be able to recover or may not. There are, there are many um, conditions in that in a sort of vulnerability analysis that we're looking at. And also to think about equity. Um, that it's not just the average level of poverty, it's also the variance in poverty among people. Um, I'm just going to briefly mention these scale effects. I know you're all aware of this, um, and it's come up several times, but um, with the relationship to ecosystem services and poverty alleviation, which is very core, um, something that has many um, scaling processes, both spatially and temporally. Um, and there are political and biophysical scales, there are governments and institutions that can be at many scales, and there are winners and losers um, at many scales. And I just put them that from the um, Southern African Millennium Ecosystem Assessment in. It's a really interesting assessment across scales. So they went everything from local to uh, water basin scale to region scale. So they're flipping from a social scale to a biophysical scale to a political scale. And they looked at winners and losers from ecosystem services across those scales. It's very complicated, so that's what we need. Um, the systems that you're looking at are, of course, not static. There are these many drivers of change going on, some of them very rapidly. Um, I think uh, it's already been discussed that in, in many of the areas, there's rapid demographic change, economic change, social political change, cultural behaviour, science and technology. And those are the kind of indirect drivers, and then there's a whole thing affecting landscapes that we need to system to follow to change. Now what this means is that when you're thinking about temporal scales, um, projects need to very carefully think how they're doing this projecting forward. Um, so if you imagine a time scale that goes from now 50 years into the future and the goal is to move from that state of poverty to some kind of poverty alleviation and most of the projects start by measuring the position now, so that's where we are now. It's very easy in a four or five year project to kind of look at the system and think where it will be in three or four years time. To just kind of roll the current processes forward, just modelling just by um, um, straight projection of current trends. But actually, it could be that a, a, and that could look like a very good solution in development terms. But it could be that there's a solution that is, is better in the long term in development terms, that has a much, uh, doesn't have quite the same benefits in the short term. And you don't know that until you look further forward some of these dynamics are much more the time scales um, than others and the short term may not pick it up. And actually there may be a completely um, different solution. Um, there may be a set of states and circumstances in that longer term um, that is not a straight projection of any kind of any kind of foreseeable um, projection. But, you know, that the, if, the, if the world were different, it could actually be in a much better place. And this is what scenario modeling is really there for. How, what can we think of that um, could actually provide lots of win-win solutions here? And in particular, how do we get from here to where that, to where that problem is? And this is the issue, actually, that we're going to try and address in the Models and Scenarios workshop that we're holding next month. Um, so those of you who are coming to that group, this is what we're going to try and explore a bit more, is, is how to do this kind of thing in this context. Okay, and I think that's...
That's right, we've got, we've got five minutes for questions. Does the um, does the Fisher um, kind of mapping out of goods and benefits make the idea of provisioning systems almost redundant in systems that are overwhelmingly managed? No, no. So the provisioning services would mean that you would be the ecosystem services that you're managing landscapes for in order to provide food, water, energy. So the, there it would be managing landscape for crops, um, for wetlands, you know. So I don't think it does. What it does make redundant actually is the supporting services, uh, because they just become ecosystem processes. And I mean, we haven't worked through this fully, but I think it also makes a lot of cultural services simply goods. I think cultural services disappear because they're just goods and benefits. Uh, I had actually related question about that because actually the Millennium Assessment has definition called on ecosystem services. Ecosystem services equal the benefits that humans derive from nature. The benefits is there, therefore our team or my understanding and the, the team of our our team understanding is always looking from the benefit side of on ecosystem service yeah. and on the goods and benefits. And therefore, we were starting always on that beneficiary side, right? and then working out maybe the source and mapping the flows, actually. When, when you come to looking at the condition of people and, and, the, and the changes in well-being that people get from different kinds of ecosystem management, if you, tr if you treat um, services and goods exactly the same, it becomes very difficult to look at alternative ways of, say, providing good health, or enough food, or clean water. So, if, so, so I, I mean, the main point I think about that is to start from the people side, to start from yeah. people and the way that their well-being is being affected by goods and benefits that come from the environment, and then go backwards into yeah. the ecosystem yeah. and the services. The problem with the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment um, is that it started from the environment. So it kind of included everything yeah. as it was, and then said all this is necessary for everything that people right. receive from it. And then the team was the team, building on the Millennium yeah, Assessment. I think assessment. the team makes they, the same mistake. Well, so, you're right, so. but they have <laughs> re reassessed the List of the services yeah. that they used to exclude, they excluded, yeah? Yeah. The but they still treat support. services and goods as the same thing in the assessment. So that you can't look at, if you, you can have the same good, the same good providing the same differential effects on well being, but actually it could be provided by a different combination of services from the environment. Right. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I'm very interested in your interesting concept of the point B or C being potentially preferable to A. Um, and, and the C one's incredibly fascinating. And I've not attended this workshop with some of the Mount Consortium Arts, it would be interesting to hear how it goes. But, but what worries me about that is, is will there ever be a political landscape in which something like that can work when they're working on a yeah. shorter time? So I think there are different ways to think about C. If, I mean, the scenarios world, which tries to think of those A, Bs and Cs, basically, say that scenarios should not represent real policy options. That actually you use your scenario storyline to paint a set of alternative kinds of policy interventions. And they're not realistic policy options but they allow you to disaggregate various kinds of things. And the Millennium Ecosystem one was proactive environmental panel versus reactive global versus regional. Um, some of the current climate ones, you know, low emissions, high emissions. So they're not meant to be real representations of the future, but they allow you to talk to policy makers going, we cannot find a single way where if you manage this catchment um, in this way, 
you will improve the world. But we can find two ways in which we can manage it more. So I think, I think it's thinking about how, how that AB and C are developed and not presenting them as heroes of policy, but as a set of storylines that represent alternative views of policy. Just one last question. Um, yeah, it was just, you know, because we talked about this at the Oxford workshop, didn't we? And someone made an intervention about how, you know, the, the, the inputs that we, we put in to get benefits don't just occur at the final step. So humans have actually influenced yeah. the systems way back when with nutrient cycles and all the rest of it. You haven't incorporated that in, so you haven't modified, because I thought that was a really good point, actually, because it's not just right at the end, natural, 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 and then right at the end we put a capital input and take no. out a good. No, but at the beginning, I think the bit it, there are two there are two significant stages to this. This is within the, the green bit is what's going on in the ecosystem, and you ma and what you want to know is how do I manage this landscape mm -hmm. to get these kinds of goods. So at this point, the interventions that you're making these up there, what does it say? Solar and other physical input. You know, so it's all the things that managers are doing. So that's human too. It's human and natural. Okay, so, so you're managing. But here, mm -hmm. when you get these, um, when you get the goods, you're actually they're, they are financial capital inputs. They are. We need money for lorries to take them in to cut what the trees down. What about cultural ones then? That you wouldn't necessarily have a cap. You wouldn't necessarily put capital input to get a cultural. Good, would you? Uh, you might need a capital input to put a fence around the protected area. No, I sh I, obviously there are situations, but not every cultural service needs a capital input, does it? No, but, but not, it's not saying, I mean, these are hugely variable. You know, if you take, I don't know, the heating in this room, ultimately you can trace that back to here. But 95, 98% of it is capital inputs. That the thing for, for many poor people is, their livelihoods are not buffered by all that capital infrastructure in between. It's, okay. it's really different. I think the inputs that you're putting here are landscape management options. Okay, so to answer my question, there is like a human arrow, that top arrow is yeah. a human intervention as well. Yeah. Well, some of it is, yeah. Because, you know, not, if you go back to the ones that sound like the five categories, not the only ones in the so it's, it's not just... No, it's more the early interventions. I mean, I've made two points there, but it's more the early interventions that change. Can I just suggest, I mean, we might be quite, that point was quite good, though, Jeff almost had two arrows there, one which said natural and one which said people. You have to follow up just because then I think yeah. that, would, that, would, that would hit that question in the butt, wouldn't it? Yeah, although I think, I mean, I think there's a bit of a false distinction between natural and human. I mean, uh, okay. They kind of, there's a whole, a lot of them are, what, what would you say? So adjusting the water table, what is that? Is that natural or human? Well, I suppose but, but, that's a really important. Well, true. Well, what made you just say natural and human? Then you made you label them one arrow and just. But, but, but I suppose the recognition that people or humans are affecting yeah. the, are now influencing these things in a way that that didn't go. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, it's, it's, you need people to have these services, don't you? Yeah. 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 Y